All right, everybody. Um, I want to say a big thank you um, for turning out for the first, I think it's the first seminar of PCAT 2022, Palm Springs. And getting here at this hour of the morning, maybe it's nothing for you, maybe you're used to waking up early in the morning, and this is actually late, but for, I know for some of you, this is an early morning. So I appreciate you being here. I also appreciate the fact that you've come to a seminar that has implications about your very personal life. So it wouldn't surprise me at all to find out that some people are you know, concerned. I wonder who saw me going to the erection struggle <laughs> seminar, and, um, what they might think about my manhood, or my man's manhood. And um, so I think it takes um, a bit of courage to come here, but also a bit of curiosity. And that's really what I want to appeal to today. I think the strength of, uh, of this kind of discussion comes from actually being open with each other and saying what so often doesn't get said. Because I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a researcher, I squeaked through grade 10 biology and that was it for me <laughs> in terms of my expertise. So I'm not the person to listen to for a uh, strong message on the current science. I'm a person who has struggled with erection issues for a long time. And in the course of my journey, I've tried a lot of different um, solutions. And so I just want to, I guess in true monogamous marriage style, share my experiences with you and also invite you to share yours with all of us so that together we can not only maybe break a little bit of stigma around the subject, but also hear some ideas from me or from someone else makes you go, oh, I should think about that. And I'm certainly open to answering questions along the way. This is a very interruptible presentation. So don't think that I have a tightly paced presentation for you. I'm really just going to share um, about my journey and then invite you to participate by any point along the way that you have something to say that you think can be helpful or a question that you are afraid you won't remember till the end. Just put up your hand, say <coughs> hey, and um, stand up and uh, we will get that question or that comment dealt with. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, my experience. My very earliest experience with erection struggles has uh, has a deep meaning that I haven't even fully understood yet. And that happened to me in 2003. So this was before the days of Liam and Kate. This was in my previous marriage. And so again, I wanna be open and vulnerable with you. So partly the way I dealt with a very unsatisfying first marriage and unsatisfying in many ways, but also sexually, was that I had affairs. And so, in December of 2002, I decided that I would seek out someone. I found someone online who I thought I could have a relationship with that was meeting that person's needs. So not on a false pretense of, hey, I'm gonna leave my marriage and I'm looking for someone new, just to say, you have to assume I'm never leaving my marriage because at the time I believed I was never leaving my marriage. And, um, but if that works for you, then maybe we can build something great together. Maybe you're struggling like I'm struggling. So let's forget for a moment whether that was at all a reasonable thing to do, a morally defensible thing to do. That's what I did in December 2002. And I set something up with a, a wonderful woman. I was going to meet her for the first time beyond um, getting together for lunch and our online conversations we were meeting at a hotel, we were going to have sex. And for the first time in my life, I got this intuition like, I'm worried if it's going to work. I'm worried if I'm gonna have an erection. And I don't know where that came from. I'd never ever had a problem um, before that. Um, but I got into the room and I did have a problem. And so it was frightening to me. And I immediately went and found out about a men's clinic in the Toronto area because Viagra was still fairly new, but I'd seen the ads on the subway. And 
I went to see a, a doctor for an appointment. But the reason I share the background information is because, you know, there's a debate, I guess I have it internally, I suppose it will never truly get solved, but how much of this issue is psychological and how much of it is physiological? So you could say, I was 41 at the time, so you could say, ah, you're right on time for your naturally decreasing <coughs> testosterone level to show up. But how does it show up to the day I first decide I'm going to do a very morally problematic thing? <laughs> so, so yes, the timing suggests from a, a science perspective that, um, that I could have, my decreasing testosterone level had begun to affect my erectile performance. But you could also say uh, very convincingly that there was a strong psychological component. So I've never solved that. I've seen indications of both things going on, but that set me off on my journey. So as I said, I went to that clinic and it was set up for men who were basically too nervous to talk to their family doctor about the issue. So you could go and just see someone you've never seen before, but in a medically supervised setting. So. I went to see the doctor and um, had the appointment. They do a whole run through. Part of their assessment was to give the patient an injection in the shaft of the penis. And the idea was to see are there any circulatory issues? So if we can medically induce an erection, then all the plumbing and wiring is fine. The issues are elsewhere, either endocrinologically, so in the hormone um, system of the body, or perhaps psychologically too. So I got the needle and it was <laughs> horrific. It was <laughs> the most painful experience, almost, that I had ever had. And I'm sorry, but did you expect otherwise? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I felt like, hey, they do this. This is they're not experimenting on me yeah. for the first time in human history. So <laughs> they probably know what they're doing. And I and the doctor even said, Oh, this is just a little pinch. You'll feel it. <laughs> so so yeah, so maybe it was foolish of me. I had I'm a positive, optimistic person. I thought this wouldn't be too bad. It was Horrible. I went into a kind of self-protective shock, like you know, that you immediately protect the most vulnerable part of your body. So this is, and it was described to me as the gold standard erectile performance solution, which was this injection. I believe it was alprostadil, was the drug. And but guess who was in such a state of I don't know. Error, trauma, I guess it was trauma. <laughs> Even that gold standard injection couldn't induce an erection in me. So they had to just kind of proceed with the appointment without that. And so I ended up getting a prescription for Viagra. So I used it and I met with that individual the next time and everything was awesome. And so, so from that Time on, so I'm saying that's December 2002. So we are now almost be 20 years ago. Um, I started to not at home with my ex-wife and a few times that we had sex, but when I was um, with this other person, I would use a pill. And so, <coughs> but after a while, I feel I developed a, like a psychological dependence, either on my ability to have an erection at all or to have the best, hardest, longest lasting erection. So I just thought, yeah, I'm gonna use it. So, so Viagra has a four hour window to take it. So what it means is, and it takes 45 minutes to start to work in the body. So what it means is you have to make a prediction about your, um, about the next time you're gonna have sex. So, so 45 minutes warning, I've got a, 40, a four hour window to work with. So I was soon very frustrated. Now this is something about um, my previous marriage in that I found I can't predict even within four hours when I'm gonna have sex again. It's so random, it's just like she turns over and oh, we're doing it, this is great. I wish I had known 45 minutes ago, but I'm <laughs> scrambled, maybe I will, um, 
see if I can delay things a little bit and um, get the help that I, if I didn't need it, I at least wanted it. And so, um, so I carried on like that. I tried to get better at seeing sort of pattern, a way I can tell. Then I heard about Cialis. So Cialis, also about 45 minutes to work. And, but that window was 36 hours. So the pressure's off. Can you predict within 36 hours when you're gonna have sex? So it sounds pretty good, but that, it's just a, uh, an indication of how random our sex life was. I couldn't do it within 36 hours. Mm -hmm. It was literally just like today, and then it happened tomorrow, and then it happened a month and a half later, mm -hmm. and I couldn't tell. So it was frustrating. Um, but for the purpose of the extramarital relationships, which are, if nothing else, very tightly scheduled, um, to get two people who are in the same room, who aren't supposed to be in that room, take some planning. So those, um, those drugs worked well for me for a time, but I was concerned about the, um, I guess about that initial question, about how much of this is physiological, how much of this is psychological, I can sense I'm becoming at some level dependent on a medication. I don't like that. I would like to have a more natural solution. So I saw, I became aware of a person named, I don't know if he's a doctor even, but his name is Surtees, S-U-R-T-E-E-S, and he has the Surtees method, which is basically a form of pre-recorded hypnosis that you could subscribe to his service, put the headphones on, of course, like everything else on the internet, the testimonials were phenomenal. <laughs> These lives were completely transformed by the Surtees method. So um, I did that, I put the headphones on, I heard lots of murmuring, soothing tones about rock hard production. <laughs> <laughs> you will have a never failing hard on. Anyway, to try to get that message embedded in the mind where um, there is some control of these things. So, it's hard to tell with stuff like that, whether it's actually working or not. So you, you have another, um, a good performance, but is it good enough to say, hey, I'm not gonna take a pill, I'm just gonna rely on the Surtees method to get me through this, and it was, maybe that's my personality type. Every sexual encounter was a high stakes sexual encounter. Like this had to be the best performance of a lifetime. So I really couldn't test it, but I didn't feel intuitively within myself introspectively that this kind of pre-recorded hypnosis was working. But I, um, but it may have worked. I can't even tell you for sure um, that it didn't. But I continued on in my journey, but as, as I was looking for more natural um, solutions, I was, sorry, I might have moved my slides wrong. Um, I came across something called yohimbine. And so yohimbine is a drug, it's actually researched. Um, it, in Canada, was a prescription drug made from the bark of a tree in Africa. And so there are a number of different um, options that you'll see like that out there. I tried it, it didn't seem very effective. I was able to just experiment at home in a lower stakes sexual setting and um, didn't feel that it did very much. But there was some evidence that with some people, it could help. <coughs> Pardon me. And so, so I continued on, um, and then at a certain point, I decided to leave my marriage. And I left my marriage because I had met the most amazing woman I had ever met in my entire life. She was beautiful. Um, and so we, we had met each other in real life, but wasn't looking for an affair. We had just met through church of all places. And, um, and so we got out of our marriages and into a relationship. And the first time we were set to have sex, it, I was in a bit of a panic. And she did great. I did not so <laughs> um, and so I was once again thrown back in that position like, oh, I have not solved this problem. Whatever this problem is, physiological or psychological, I've not solved it. But I was hearing a lot about, hey, do you have low T? You've heard those ads. And so I went to see a doctor um, about that and had my, 
testosterone level checked, and I saw a doctor in Canada who said, no, you're fine, you're in the normal range. It's, your testosterone level is not an issue. And so I wasn't happy with that because I had self-diagnosed myself. And <laughs> testosterone was a big issue that I needed to solve. But I needed a doctor's help to solve that. So I went to the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland um, where I saw um, three specialists. I saw a psychologist to discuss the problem. I saw a urologist to discuss the problem. I saw an endocrinologist to discuss the problem. So the endocrinologist looked at my levels and maybe it's the United States, the freewheeling land of medical improvisation. And he said, yeah, I can get your prescription for that. Maybe he just felt sorry for me because I'd driven so far around <laughs> right there. And so, um, so I started using a product called Androgel, at least in Canada, I don't know if it's the same thing here, but it's called a transdermal, it's basically just rub it on the skin. I wasn't interested in injecting anything in my body on a regular basis. I didn't know about other options, I know there are pellets now and other things. But the idea was that you could apply a 1% testosterone cream and enough of it would migrate through the skin into the bloodstream and affect your level. So I, I started using that and I remember we took a trip to New York. This is so great talking to a group of lifestyle people because I can tell you what really happens. <laughs> so, so I'm putting it on. I feel nothing the first day, but I understand it's going to be a cumulative effect. It's going to build up in the body. So, so, so I started using it. It happened to be 10 days in advance of a trip we were making to New York. So our first trip together ever. Yes. Yeah. So it was, uh, again, kind of high stakes. But I've, got the, but I've got the Cialis on my side, I've got whatever the Surtees method gave me on my side, and I've got the Androgel now um, coming to the rescue. So I, I put on, by the time we get to New York, I'm fucking on fire. <laughs> we're, it's, we're in the back of the cab, my cock is out in the back of the cab. And um, I'm feeling like- I helped with that. Yeah, didn't spontaneously pop out, and I didn't do it myself. That's this um, amazing woman who uh, made that happen. So driving along, and so I'm thinking, this is the promised land. This is like being 17 again. And so, um, so that turned out to be kind of a spike at the time. I felt Andrew Joe really helped. Unlike the self hypnosis. I felt like the Andrew Joe really made a difference. And I've subsequently found out what the difference is when I've discontinued it because I've experimented. I'm a relentless self experimenter in a lot of ways with exercise and diet, but also with medication where I feel like there is room to experiment. So with some kind of medical support for the idea. And so when I have stopped the Andrew Joe, it's my libido has taken a dive. Now, so that means it's doing something when it's in there because the <laughs> is having a negative effect. Now, you could also say, well, that's because your endogenous production of testosterone, so what you naturally produce is being, um, uh, is being you're not getting any exogenous now, so the endogenous system is gonna take a while to kick back in. So I can't say I was totally scientific about it, but I definitely felt the effect of it, and so, so it became, to this day, <coughs> part of how I do it. And I experimented with the dosage. I was given a range that I could use. And um, so I'm generally in the lower part of the range, strangely enough, because someone like me, it's hard to resist that. They're like, well, if this much works, imagine how much that will do. <laughs> but I have found, and it's gonna come up later with some other things we can talk about, um, that it is, um, there is a sweet spot. And the sweet spot is not always the max. Sometimes the sweet spot is somewhat below um, maximum. So, so I did that, and that had made a big difference. Then I start to hear about um, shockwave therapy. So does anyone just, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay, <laughs> this gentleman does. I did it. And it's a, it's a therapy that's used, I think, in a lot of different body parts, a lot of different ways, but it's generally the idea of hormesis. So hormesis is you stress the body and the body strengthens in response to stress. So that's why our broken bones repair stronger than when uh, before we broke them. It's why our muscles grow when we get those micro tears from lifting lots of weight. And 
um, with shockwave is basically what happened was, this is what this, the, um, the therapy looks like. You go in, take your clothes off, you've got one of those medical gowns on, you're reclining, very nice nurse comes in, uh, parts the medical gown, takes your cock out, and pummels it with a vibrating <laughs> toothpaste. <laughs> you know, like games with it, right? That's yeah, games with it. That's right. Yeah, so I don't know if there's some electrical transference going on. I should know, it was my body. I should have researched it better. But, uh, so I don't know whether it's just the percussion or whether there's uh, electrical um, current being transferred into my cock. But anyway, um, so I did that. Um, it did nothing. In fact, my intuition was that it set me back. So it was medically supported. I read some peer-reviewed studies on the procedure. But not for me. I think again, it was very much like being on the uh, on the table at that clinic back in 2002. I felt assaulted, <laughs> and so I went through six of those. They said that they like to team it up with a an injection, a PRP injection, platelet-rich plasma, which is used in lots of different parts of the body. It can be used to regrow hair and or preserve the hair you've got. So um, yes, I'm considering. <laughs> that, uh, good. But at that stage, I was still kind of not into having an, something injected into my cock. So, and I just felt like the whole um, the whole procedure had not worked well. So, so I was still continuing on basically with my androgel and um, and with the Cialis. I started to, and so this is where I, I'm on very medically shaky ground because there's no research about it, but my experience with it, I started using higher doses. So, you know, um, Cialis comes in five, 10, and 20 milligrams. So I started to, I, I'd have a prescription for fives and 20, so I started to go, I'm gonna go 25, 30, and a bit of that more is better idea. And I did, I know some people have done that and had headaches and other bad reactions. I had no headaches. So I had some success with that, but basically I arrived at a place a few years ago where I was feeling in lifestyle situations like almost like the group sex idea is just not for me. I was really struggling. So while all these other things I was doing worked really well in my home life, um, any of you who follow us on Patreon know what our sex looks like. It's pretty rigorous, but, um, uh, but in, in a situation with other people, it was really difficult. So obviously that is psychological. So if you're performing well in one context and poorly in another, it's not like your body chemistry is changing. It's something about how you look at the situation, what your expectations of yourself and others are, um, how desperately you want to please people. So any of you who follow the Enneagram idea, I'm an Enneagram three. So I'm a performer, so it's just like built into me. I want every experience with every human being I ever encounter to be as close to mind-blowing for them as possible. <laughs> so, so that's a lot to bear in a sexual situation, um, bringing into it. So I, I started looking at a couple of options, one of which was the injection, that thing that had caused me so much pain back in 2002. So it's called Alprostadil um, or Caverject in Canada. There's something called Trimix that's available um, in the US. We don't have it in Canada. Um, but I just thought again and that it would be good to take a look at it. And the reason I thought that was because you know, one of the wonderful things about writing a blog and doing a podcast is, yes, you have a chance to say things to people, but people also write into you. And sometimes they're saying really nice things about, hey, I really like what you said and you've helped us, but sometimes they had information for you. And so one person said to me, you know what, your situation sounds very similar to mine. And I've had great success using uh, the Alprostadil injection. And he said, you know what, it doesn't hurt. The needle's a very, very fine uh, bore and it, um, it barely feels like a pigeon. Sometimes I don't actually feel it at all. So I started to rethink my experience that I had a few years ago, and I wondered, you know, it was just one time, and maybe, maybe it was a nurse who had administered it, and maybe she was just 
not a good nurse. Or maybe <laughs> there was some other part of the procedure that she had not followed properly. But this person's um, testimonial was very convincing to me. And then I started to think, so now I'm going to share my perceptions on male anatomy. I don't know you guys, if you feel the same. If they had said, this injection has to go into the head of your cock, I would say, I can't do that. If they said, this has to go into your testicle, I would say, I can't do that. But somehow the shaft of the penis, I thought, like, in sex, I don't mind. It gets slapped a little bit. Like, it's kind of like, it's kind of sensitive, but kind of resilient, too. So I thought, you know what, I could maybe handle this. And there's so much at stake. Imagine if I had a guaranteed erection in lifestyle situations. What a game changer that would be for me. And so the overwhelming bit of evidence that pushed me over the edge is I read some of the research with my limited scientific knowledge as best I could understand them. And there was a study done that this drug could induce an erection in a comatose <laughs> so, so, forget that that's a very sickening idea. <laughs> Injecting into the penis of a comatose cat. But I thought, wow, that's what I've been searching for my whole life. <laughs> in erection in a comatose cat, maybe even with me, it could overpower the, the psychological dimension. So, so, I went for it. And I remember the night I said, Sweetie, just imagine, if this works, what a game changer it would be for me. And you know, I had something that, um, that felt very personal to me in that I said, you know, I've never, and it's something that Danielle has mentioned a few times to me, I have never been able to be my best self in a lifestyle situation. So she said, I want to see you be with others who you are with me, and I'm saying, because I'm really worried, I'm preoccupied um, in a play situation. I want to be my best self. I want to make a great experience for someone. But I'm just constantly thinking about my car and this thing that I can't control. I'd often said in the past, you know, if a woman said to me, again, as an Enneagram 3, a performer, you know what, I could have a stunning orgasm if you did 100 push-ups right now. I've never done 100 push-ups in my life. I would do push-ups to make her have the most amazing orgasm in her life. Because I can do that. I can get on the floor and I can just keep going. But if it depends on my car getting hard and staying hard, I don't know how to control that. There's a system inside me that I have no access to or very little access to. And so if I had a medication that could do that <coughs> for me, even if it means making an injection in my penis, I'm at least interested in experimenting. So we were at home, I went down the hall to our other washroom while she was waiting, and I got it out, and you know, I measured it up, and did all the things I was supposed to do. And I hovered there <laughs> a second, and then I just remembered what it would mean if it actually worked, and that it was going to be survivable if it was painful. Um, I had survived it before, and so I put it in, it didn't hurt. Um, it felt kind of like that pinch, the way it was described to me the first time. So I really don't know what that nurse did back in 2002. <laughs> uh, I have my theory, but I won't speculate. Um, but, but it wasn't bad. And so you're supposed to massage it. So an injection, do the massaging thing, and then it starts to happen. And I'm not in a particularly turned on situation. I'm experimenting with an injection. I've never injected myself with anything anywhere. So um, it's really started to happen, and then it was, then it was really on. Like there it is. Like and so um, now, now this is at home with my wife. It's a low stakes situation, but it felt different. You know the way we experience our lives and our bodies. Um, we have very strong intuitions, and sometimes we're wrong. But in this case, it felt like this was the game changer that I had been looking for. So I. So I began to use it, and I, it was just a few days before a trip to Vancouver to see friends that um, we had had a sexual experience with the year before. Um, and but this was the first time I was going to use, <coughs> pardon me, in in a real life situation. So it does require some coordination. 
because what you have to do with this particular, with the way that I was using it then, was you get a powdered form of the drug. You have a, I guess, a saline solution in the, um, in the syringe. You have to put in, you have to wipe the top. I've seen doctors do this, now I understand what they're doing. Um, with a disinfecting um, wipe and put it in, draw it up right, the right amount, which means if you're a person who doesn't have great close vision, you need to remember to have your glasses there. So glasses, a kit, I pull it in, get the dosage just right, and then inject it, So and then do the little massage thing. And then get it. So I, I have my routine down to, I've tried it a few times at home, I've refurbished it at home. So I have my routine at home. So basically like, you know, in any sexual situation, say, hey, I'm just gonna go wash it and I'll see you in five minutes. I think you got five minutes. If it turns into 20 minutes, it's attention getting. You do it in the washroom for 20 minutes. And so, so I had it down to five minutes and it came out and it worked spectacularly well. How do I know? Because I really wasn't super turned on in the situation. This couple was a fantastic couple, but, my, but the sexual chemistry wasn't great. But that was actually ideal for my experiment because if it works with the most amazing woman in, in the world, well, <laughs> what's it? Is it the drug or just the most amazing woman in the world? But um, that was not the case. So I felt super heartened. I actually had the dose probably a little too high at that point. It was kind of painful. So oral, like oral caressing with the lips and tongue, nice. Oral sucking, whoa, that's <laughs> like, that's too much. So I had to, I learned eventually to back off the dosage a little bit in my experiments. Um, but it worked really well. Until about nine months later, I had two experiences in a row where it didn't work. And I felt like from the moment of injection, I'm not feeling it, like what's going on here? Now, of course, that you could say starts a cascade of negative expectations too. So again, the psychological dimension is real, but I, um, but I could feel it wasn't working. And then when I got in the situation, it was not working. So. So that was a kind of a different pan, yes. Do, do you need to get it into a specific location or you can pretty much put it anywhere into the shaft? Yeah, it's weird. It's, it's like there's a corpus cavernosa, which are the two yeah. bodies that run the length of the penis that are the erectile, um, uh, the erectile the channel. tissues. Channels, tissues, yeah, both of them. <laughs> um, and so, so you only have to inject it into one. You have to avoid a vein, so you're just looking just on the surface, avoid being and put it in. But what it turned out the culprit was, I looked back at the medication and it was near its expiry. So I felt like, uh, like very near its expiry. So I thought that could have been the problem. But again, it set in a little panic. So I be, had become aware of a guided hypnosis um, approach. So this was practice in Toronto and San Francisco that specialized in hypnosis specifically for sex related issues. And it was really great. If any of you are interested later, I should have actually put a slide with their contact information, but I'm super happy to provide it. These guys are fantastic. Um, they have experience with non-monogamy. You're not gonna shock them um, with anything you share. In fact, he shocked me one time with something he shared back. So. Um, <laughs> So it was a very comfortable situation, but they take a very, um, a very customized approach to hypnosis. So a friend of mine and I did it at the same time, and our experiences were completely different. And that's because the practitioner was really listening to where we were coming from and trying to make a difference. And the difference, the thing that he focused in on me, which I knew was an issue, was a confidence thing, a confidence. So it was interesting, you know, when. We were doing our introduction session yesterday. Kate was talking about, you know, very, um, very openly about feeling like I'm not a confident person. And you see her in this leadership role and think, wow, the magical Kate. She just was bound from success to success, but she doesn't. She's so open with all of us and she shares that. And I have that, and I'm guessing at some level, every single one of you have that confidence thing where you just feel unsure of yourself, unsure of your attractiveness. Well, why would someone want to be with me? And so, so he really did a great job of focusing in on that. And so it turned out that the medication wasn't a problem because once I got a proper prescription that was not at the end of its, um, at the end of its effectiveness, 
that I was fine, but I really do believe that that hypnosis made a gigantic difference because in other areas, you know, sorry, I'm just gonna check how I'm doing here. Um, at, at some stages, um, or in, in, many, in some situations rather, in the lifestyle, it's been, you know, the basic lifestyle pattern, which is, okay, we've had dinner, or we danced, or we chatted, and it's sex time, so time for people to take off their clothes and find a partner and have sex with them. And so, not a situation that worked particularly well for me, but we were at a small dinner party, just six people, so three couples, and it was kind of that musical chairs thing, so it was time to have sex, and uh oh, it's me and Lauren. And in the past, I know what I would have done. I would have, I would have said, oh, Lauren's probably going, oh, Don, like, how did I end up with him? I really would have liked to have Daniele or some other guy there. But in this case, I didn't. I just thought, uh oh, I'm, I'm good and I've got some things to offer and this is going to be great. And it's very hard for me to describe now. I'm, I'm telling you kind of what the mental process was like, but it felt very different to me. And that felt like the hypnosis having an effect, just changing my assumption about what my appeal would be and how unimportant the things that I worry about are. And so, so I think, so I feel like I have my system now after all these years. Because I have my system, it doesn't mean it has to be your system, of course. Our individual differences are so gigantic physiologically and then psychologically just in multiples beyond that. But um, I did want to share um, what that was like. You know, we talked about the, the, the idea of when you're looking to problem solve a situation like that, you know, obviously body chemistry, that's something that you see a doctor for. You cannot figure that out yourself. Um, Self-doubt, you might see a therapist for that, or you might see um, a hypnotist, but you can also look at other things. So I put, this sounds way too technical, suboptimal interpersonal dynamics, which is just, am I having sex I'm, with people I'm not attracted to? And it's not like saying, oh, you should only be with the hotties and then you'll have no problem, because attraction is so complex. So I could be with literally the most beautiful woman in the world, which I, Practically am, every night. <laughs> but um, but say in a lifestyle situation, some other really beautiful woman. But if there's nothing going on between us, it's going to be a disaster. And so finding ways to put ourselves in situations that work better for us is really important. And that and focusing on what is a connection. What in say if you look at your best situation, what was going on there that made that work so well, and then these other times not. And you can out some answers. Also suboptimal play contexts. So I heard, was overhearing someone yesterday talk about how much they love orgies. I guess it was at the presenter's um, introduction yesterday. And you know, there's the, there's the guy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's great, like you hear it and you go, and I'm also married to someone who really functions well in orgies. Like that idea of, hey, there are so many people available, I can just move on. It's not this intense connection with one individual. It's like just, hey, you can get a bit of my magic and then I'm gonna go on and get a bit of his magic and that works really well. Not really for me at all, the orgy situation. So maybe you can, of course, we're all, you know, we're all here as part of a team of two and that we're negotiating our, our journey through the lifestyle with. And it can be just a matter of talking together, yeah, sometimes I'm gonna do this thing, so I'm not giving up on orgies because I'm with someone who's a gifted orgy performer. <laughs> um, and I want to support her in that. It's not like, it's not like they're terrible by, you know, by any stretch. But, um, but it's not my best situation. But I'm gonna support her, but, I'm gonna, but we're also gonna look for situations that work really well for me as well and have kind of a balance. And so, <clears throat> pardon me. What I want to do now in our last um, 15 minutes together is this is where I want to open it up a bit um, and just talk about what we can do to make the situation better. Someone wrote me a note um, in advance of this session, a question, and said, you know, how can I help my man or any other man in a situation when it's just not happening for him? And so I love that. It was such a, it was such a compassionate question. Like, and it underscores something that I think is super important for men to learn. I think we feel a 
little bit because, you know, evolutionarily, men kind of do their performance, you know, so if you're rams, you butt heads together to try to impress a female. So if you're a bower bird, you put together a bunch of little <laughs> shiny objects to try to attract a female from up in the trees. But if you're a man, you're going through all these things, but a woman is going to decide if what you're offering is, you know, at the mating level, worthy of producing offspring with. And so, but my experience is, and you probably all know this intuitively, is, is there a gentler, kinder, more patient group of human beings than basically womankind? <laughs> like, we go about thinking, oh, they're gonna judge me harshly. They're gonna say, you know you're out. And, and I suppose there are some like that, but very few, and generally not in the lifestyle at all. What a compassionate, sensitive group. So even just internalizing that message that, you know, my worst fear, which is that she's gonna point and laugh and say, look whose cock's not performing, is just like, of course that's never gonna happen. It's a, it's a very supportive group of people. So she was, this woman who wrote to me said, I want to make it better for men in a situation like this. So, um, so I wanna throw it open to some ideas right now. So I just put some little prompts here. Do we say something? Do we acknowledge the situation? Hey, I see it's not kinda of going for you so well. What can we do? Um, is there something else I can do? Those kinds of things. Do we say nothing? Do we say, oh, maybe it'll be more preserving of his dignity? Like, we're just gonna take it in a different direction and not really say anything and, and fluster him. Mm -hmm. um, do we change it up in the moment? So is there something that we can transition to that will help? Whether the transition is through chatting, cuddling, massaging. Um, and then obviously in any situation where things are going wrong, my mind always goes to the future. So I'm in this situation now, I'm gonna try to make the best of it, but maybe there are things I can do in the future. As I said earlier, about looking for different play situations or different play partners. But I just want to throw it open now. If anyone has thoughts on this subject, things that have worked really well for you in the past, or ideas that you've had just on your own. Yes. Hi, my name's Rod. Hey, Rod. Uh, Rod, I think it's, uh, uh, I've probably had more practice dealing with this than anyone in this room. Because <laughs> I'm always hearing about people, you know, in their 40s, they start struggling with erections. I've been struggling since I was 18. Wow. Uh, when I was, my, my poor, now, ex-wife in the early beginning of our relationship, the only time we had sex was with like when I could surprise her in the middle of the night with a, you know, a, my night boner. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, it, and it, I had no idea what was going on. Well, then we were married for years and everything was fine and didn't think a thing of it. And then after we divorced, each time I got into a new relationship, it was the same thing. And I could never figure out what it was. And it finally went on long enough that Several years ago, I just got to the point where when I was talking to a woman, I would just say, look, here's the thing. It, it never seems to function early on, but I got a whole body we can use. Yeah. <laughs> I just was like, I'm just gonna lay it out there. And it's just been fine. I just had to get used to the idea that, yeah, women just are just the same. They just want to enjoy the connection. Right. And so then I could give it a chance. Um, and, and then it would be fine. I just had to get over that. You know, for me, it was, it was similar. It was all about, does she really want to be doing this? Right. You know, with me, and then, and then, is she happy? And the, I'm a two. Okay. <laughs> so it's all about people pleasing. Yes, and all right. That sort of thing. And then the, the, where it took another step up with Jane, who I'm with on this trip. Yep. Um, she doesn't have direction issues, so she didn't come. <laughs> but, um, but when I got with her, the difference was uh, sort of similar to what you guys went through. I all of my previous relationships had been with relatively conservative people. Right. And I got with Jane, and I mean, before we even met in person, we'd established by email that, oh, we like sex. Right. And so I went through with her a phase of what I call kid in the candy store, where I couldn't get it up just because I was so excited to do everything. Right. And uh, so yeah, I went through all kinds of different things and have became a fan of Cialis. I, I can't, I do get a headache and heartburn and stuff. Oh. So then I found the Trimix. Right. Yeah, I remember, you know, actually I'd heard of it, um, but thought it was some weird underground thing. Mm -hmm. And then it was Mickey uh, talking about it on the casual swing. It was like, oh wait, this is a medical thing? Like you go to your doctor? Right. Well, I found a place online and I watched the videos about how to do it. And 
I remember the first time I was going to do it. I mean, it took like 10 minutes just <laughs> and sweating. And yeah. just going, I, 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 I. And so, and then, yeah, it's like you do it, you're like, oh, that was not a big deal at all. Right. When you do it in the right place, yeah, I've done it a dozen times since then. And there are times I don't even feel it. It's, you, you get it at just the right place. I have done too much once. No. Very painful. Yes. Um, and so if anybody's going to ever do it, they always tell you you have to have sufedrin uh, oh. or something. Because if you take that, then it, then it dooms you to the effects. So, right. Yeah, I didn't do that much. But when you find your right dosage, yeah, boy, it's, it's a swell thing. So, yeah. There you awesome. Go. Well, thanks for sharing, Brian. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Yeah, just a, a question for you. So I, I'm John, and we're, my wife Jennifer and I are immune to the kind of dipping our toe in. So we, yeah. we haven't played with other people, but you know, hopefully it'll be a progression for us. Right. But I'm kind of curious listening to, you know, I think all, all of us men, or probably most guys, feel similar to you in that you, know, you really are focused on your the person that you're having your experience with and wanting to please them. So that does, that does put pressure on you. But, in other situations, like say masturbating, like do you ever experience any of those issues? Do you have a uh, erectile problem say you want to masturbate? Or is it really just the performance? Yeah. When you're in that situation. So now I'm gonna do the monogamous fairy scene again and share like deep information. So <laughs> I bear I barely masturbate anymore because I'm sixty, so I'm very happy to be sixty. I'm loving being sixty, but my capacity isn't infinite anymore so i just feel like if i'm gonna come i'm gonna come with her or in a lifestyle situation so i'm kind of i'm treating it i'm like i'm in preservation mode a little bit <laughs> so yeah so but occasionally you know things happen and you get turned on and yeah so so it doesn't seem to be a problem masturbating i just think the whole thing is cool so it's really a performance like um, in the moment kind of thing and like the psychological thing for me is gigantic. Whatever's going on physiologically, I believe, is dwarfed by what's going on psychologically. I think, yeah. I think you can say, I think we should all say, but realistically, like the psychological component <coughs> is the largest component for yeah. most, you know, for mm -hmm. most men. And right. just have to kind of, you know, put it put it out there. Like, okay, step up this question. But yeah, I mean, thanks. At least have to be realistically. I've been in really hot, really fun, you know, scenarios, and it's just not working. Like for no yeah. for no good reason other than it's something I've been able to uh, get some insights into like sometimes like multitasking in like a group scenario can you know can take that little bit of focus away uh, and it's really um, yeah it's just it's different for everybody but the psychological component is is huge I also have strong opinions on this as well and honestly I think as I think the onus is on penis owners to yeah. say something I think silence is a killer silence is a killer in your marriage yeah. silence is a killer within mm -hmm. these lifestyle contexts of just being able to say you know hey it's not working I mean Fred can tell this story too like it's just not it's not working for for me in this you know in this moment let's let's try X as well just because the penis owner um, <coughs> just being the one to try and put it out there like that's what we're here for destigmatizing it right. and understanding that it happens for you know whatever reason and it may come on at the uh, oftentimes at the least opportune times for you yeah um, you know within it so I think that say something that is so, and silence is, uh, is a killer about it, just destigmatize it, normalize it, a couple, and you don't want to be with somebody who's not going to respect you or like, who's going to belittle you for not having, you know, a right. heart on within that moment, like, how would you want to, you know, have an experience with that person as well, and just try to let go of some of that. Great, thank you. I got three, I got them in order here, I got this gentleman here. And so, early on in the lifestyle, when, when Phoebe and I, Laura and I were in the lifestyle, most of our, my issue safe. And so I'm focused on her anxiety, which of course is making me very anxious, and that will kill interaction like that. And I have found since then um, that the, the, the Viagra is almost a little bit of a, a placebo effect to a certain degree. Yeah, like right. it, yeah. it helps me to kind of go, I got to back up my heart. <coughs> um, and I have had situations throughout my experience where if the play situation isn't right, there was a, a rather aggressive situation we were in in Costa Rica, if you've listened to the episode, I was physically injured, um, and it was not hot at all, and, and I couldn't perform, and I basically said, I'm out, I have to 
matched up. So it, it is so much that, that psychological, like, am I worried about something? Am I focused on something else? Because if you're not focused on what you're doing, yeah. it, it is just going to destroy it. Thanks. We've got so few moments left. I'm going to ask people to be brief, but I want to get people in. So I got. So, my name's Mark, and I just, just to support what this gentleman was saying, um, I'm also a community fifty in another trophy. So, so you're very young. Is what you're <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we were talking about what we can do to make the situation better. So, um, when I was a kid, I was raised by my parents. We were all raised by our parents. My parents were of the age where you keep your problems to yourself. Yeah. Right. And especially with sexual problems, being a man. We don't talk about that shit. Um, we don't talk, period, in general. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so when I started having issues sometimes, because, you know, lower testosterone age, you know, it's, when I was 18, you could look at me and I, you know. Um, but when I started talking to my wife about it, it was being vulnerable, allowing myself to be vulnerable. I was scared of shit. Right. Um, and then I, that brought us a lot closer, too, because it was, I think that's a I think that's a great point. Like it's actually an opportunity for enhanced connection, not not the opposite, which is what we're afraid of. We've got some other people in here. This lady here wants to say something. So I, I think I really appreciate what you said about saying something because as a vagina or vulva owner, mm -hmm. it's it's hard um, growing up, and then you take it personally when somebody can't right. get an erection, mm -hmm. and it, right. it's a deep wound, right? And so yes. um, in that moment penis owner were to say, hey, it's not you, let's try something else, then it takes all the pressure off of me and, oh, am I not hot enough? Am I not turning you on? You know, all of that kind of right. emotion that comes with, oh, your penis is not That is good. such a great reminder. Thank you for putting that in the mix. Yes? Um, to bounce off of Ryan a little bit more about that story, um, <laughs> that um, one of the best experiences I've ever had was we were sitting around, we weren't even doing like circle of consent or anything like that. And the guy turned to me and said, I can't always get it up because I think you're incredibly hot. I think you're going to have a great time. And I, and I go, I will have an amazing time for you. And I, I might not be able to get it up. And, and just that at the outset, it was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, <laughs> let's go. Like, you know, yeah, that's fair. But it's better to let this in. Yeah. Right. And there was no, and so having like been with them a couple times, Yeah, it did. You know what? Because we've got another group coming in right now. I'm, you and I can talk about that. Okay. Yeah, whatever. So, um, but also I want to say too that please stop me. If there's something that you thought of here, you felt uncomfortable talking about, I love talking about this stuff. So um, I'm happy if you see me in the lobby by the pool or whatever, and you want to share something, please do that. But right now I just want to say thank you so much for coming in. Thank you.